This is the Spokane Soccer Show, and I am your sentimentalist host, Benji Wade. On today's show, Velocity FC are going to the League One playoffs. Boom. Despite the 509 community suffering a pair of back-to-back 3-2 losses at one stadium last weekend as Zephyr. And Velocity, prepare to say farewell to Spokane until March. Joining me to serve up only the best vibes about all things soccer in the fine city of Spokane, it's my friend Scott Lincoln. Later of South Hill FC. Welcome back to the show, Scott. Thanks, Benji. Yeah, glad to be here. And yeah, looking forward to talking about Velocity a little bit and giving a few shout outs. So, yeah. We got this. Wait, let's do it. Uh, I do have, have one quick announcement. The next episode of the Spokane Soccer Show, October 28th, will be special guest Ryan Harnito of USL Spokane. That's right, co owner of the team. We want to get as many questions from listeners as possible. So, Slide into the DMs on Instagram. If you're not following the Spokane Soccer Show on Instagram, you're making a mistake with your life. And you could also email if you don't want to be on Instagram, which, hey, I get it. Some mm-hmm. people don't want that algorithmic hellscape to navigate every day. And we'll repost uh, some questions. I'll repost that up on uh, Facebook, upon Ooh. as if it's like this place. But I'll post it on Facebook, too, to grab some more questions from South Hill and some of the oh. other adult, adult soccer pages. Very, very good idea. Or if you hate all social media platforms, you can go Spokane Soccer show all one word at gmail.com okay one more time october 28th ryan harnito is going to come on the show and we're just going to peel back some of the layers of things that people have wondered about i there they might be facts and some trivia that i'm privy to but i haven't really sometimes it's like not my place you know like i would rather just hear it directly from the ownership group of usl spokane so that is coming soon um We'll keep the shout outs this week simple from my side. I just want to say shout out to USL Spokane, to the Harnitos, to Mm -hmm. Coach Lee Viedman, to all the players, all the staff making the playoffs in the first ever year of Velocity FC. Yeah, I, I got to imagine that that was one of their major goals this year that was up on the, the bulletin board, how, wherever they put that, that that was one of their goals. And though uh, they backed into it in the end in the playoffs, yeah. but that that was earned earlier in the season. And so exactly. uh, they won games that they needed to win. They beat Omaha a few weeks ago. You know, that was there's some games that they really played well. They outperformed their XG a few times. I definitely think we punched outside of our weight class a few times. You're right. I mean, I think we've definitely had a, a difficult run of form and we're going to talk about that. But um, yeah, I think that the two goals were probably for a good while now get a home game in the playoffs, right? Ideally. And if you can't get that, then th- that's your stretch goal, right? Mm-hmm. But the number one goal is to make the playoffs, which we've done. Hey, so, fantastic. High five, everybody. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, as things stand, we are in seventh place with two games to go. We will most likely face forward Madison. We have an outside shot at getting and climbing into sixth place. And right now, if we were in sixth place, we would play Northern Colorado. I've got to be honest with you. There's no real easy outs in the top three in the league right now. Number one is Union Omaha. I definitely don't think we would want to face them in the first round of the playoffs, especially going to that godforsaken stadium where, where baseball is typically played. More on that uh, soon. But um, second place is Forward Madison. Mm-hmm. Third place is Northern Colorado. No easy outs. I think yeah. second and third place teams. Those are really good teams. I mean, it's in, in some way, some of the best games we played has been against Omaha. Now, I know that they're a great team, true. but we've played well against them. So I don't know if there's we a beat match- them twice. Yeah, if there's a matchup thing going on there. So that wouldn't break my heart if we end up playing Omaha. In fact, I look forward to that. Do you have any shout outs this week, Scott? Yeah, a couple shout outs. So uh, shout out to Spokane Afro Entertainment. So this okay. is very specific. Okay. This is very specific. So on the South Hill, there's a, a, a couple of a couple of guys, Eto and Pilot and DJ Pilot. So they've been playing up there for a long time. And over the last few years, at South Hill FC. Yeah, South Hill FC. So they they play up there all the oh, time. Oh, I met I met Eto. Yeah, super super cool guys. Well, uh, they they uh, D, DJ Pilot plays all over town and will do Afro nights at places. And so this last weekend, we agreed to go to some place that I thought we'd never go because you know, late forties. Who goes out on you know late on on Fridays or Saturdays? Who is we you, you and hillary Me and my wife hillary went to afro night at the red room awesome yeah and it was fantastic so shout out to those guys for the entertainment they're putting on and for the african community uh because a lot of the velocity players came and and, and spent time there too they did yeah yeah pretty cool oh they didn't come to my birthday party <laughs> did you have a dj 
Did you have DJ Pilot there? No. I, well, if I, you don't I, have DJ Pilot someplace, <laughs> then you're not going to get. I, I did you're not, not going to get the crew. You're right. But I did shout not. out to to Eto and uh, Spoken Afro Entertainment and uh, DJ Pilot for putting on a fantastic show. Well, back to the soccer. Uh, we did back. You said you use the expression already. I think I got a text from Corey who handles ticketing for uh, USL Spokane. He said, I, I'm sad that we backed into the playoffs, but nonetheless, here we are. It's it's totally true. Let's talk about it. I want to go back in time and, and look at these recent run of results. Um, we have currently lost four in a row and we are winless in five going back to the draw against uh, South Georgia Tormenta where Ahmed Longmire got the red card. Um, and in those games, this might surprise you. What would you guess our XG was in those games? Actually, I'll start because it's unfair because it's a total number of five games. But in those five games, I'll tell you ours and I want you to guess what our opponents were <laughs> in those five games. Okay, here we go. Ready? Okay. In oh. those five games. Over under this. So this is I'm your score. You this is velocity. Cheat. I'm not going to cheat. This is the velocity score. I'm going to go over or under. Yeah, I'm going to just, I'm going to, I'm going to tell, yes, exactly. I'm going to tell you our XG for the last yeah. five games. And then I'm going to ask you to guess what our opponent's collective XG is in those five games. Okay. So in those five games, dating back to the draw with South Georgia Tormenta, we then lost to uh, Forward Madison, then Union Omaha, then Central Valley Fuego, and most recently this last Saturday to Greenville Triumph. Okay, Our XG in those games was a combined 6.5. So what would you guess our opponents was in those five games? So it's really interesting because you go back and I've watched I've watched the games as they as they went in mm-hmm. the, the you know the everything as live yeah and in most cases I was pulling my hair out <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah it, it, because for a lot of reasons there were some depressing moments there for were sure. some really depressing moments yeah but then there's other moments where they're on the doorstep man they could yeah. have scored so many goals I got to believe that the the opponent's X, xG is higher is that is that the case or is it lower than ours it I, I, you're like. <laughs> Come I, on. Imagine taking a test and asking the teacher. Uh, <laughs> my gut says it's lower, but I, I think it might be right. I think it might be wrong. Okay. Well, take a guess. What would you guess? Uh, five. 6.5. Five. You think it's lower? I think okay, it's well. lower. Well, here's, here's what I think, because when I watch the highlights, we hit the post an awful lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's shockingly it's close. Yeah. It's 7.04. 7.04. Yeah. Yet we conceded 10 and only scored two in those five games. So. Going back to the September 7th, 3-2 win over Fuego, we went, Scott, in that five-game stretch, okay. 480 minutes without a goal. Not good. So how did we end up here? Let's let's get into it. I would say that it kind of started in this run. So we had the South Georgia Tormenta game mm-hmm. where that was torture because we were really playing well in the first half of that game. And then the red card happened early in the second half. So most of our XG in that game, which I think was like 0.95, so most of that came in the first, I would say, probably 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and then finish that game 0-0. Ahmed Longmire has to serve a one-game suspension. I was glad it wasn't more. I don't know if you were worried about this, but in the Premier League, violent conduct mm-hmm. is a three-match ban. Yeah, That red card would be a three-match ban. For some reason, the USL, lucky for us, it's only a one-game suspension. Did so, they just determine it wasn't? It, because when he got in the tussle, it, it somebody thought that he threw a punch or something. And when you go back and watch it, I don't it know. Could, you're, no, you're right. It could have been. They might have just reviewed it and said yeah. it's just going to be a one-game suspension. Because he kind of shook the guy. Yeah, because they did appeal the suspension, period. They appealed the red card, which yeah. I, you know, I'm not going to get into that play. It was such a long time ago. You can watch the clip of it mm-hmm. on the Spokane Soccer Show Instagram page. I definitely thought that if anybody, if they were going to send off Ahmed, they should have sent off two players yeah. because Vivas, the player for Tormenta, had his arms and hands and fists up around the collarbone of Ahmed. So anyway, so we served a one game suspension. Uh, he, was tor- did. He, he was tormenting. He was tormenting. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, and then Luis Hill, they play against uh, Ford Madison. Hmm. There's a, a, a weather delay and... Luis Hill gets injured in the first few minutes of that game, like first two minutes, I believe. I talked about this a little bit with Jamie in the last podcast, but did you get to watch any of the Union Omaha game? Yeah. Yeah. In that game, miscue after miscue with the back three. The worst for me was when five foot seven inch Aaron Gomez, midfielder for Omaha, beats both Marcelo Lodge and Cameron Miller, and he gets a free header. He just runs across the box. Marcelo doesn't pick him up. 
the attacking player for Omaha whips in across and he and they score a goal off of a, a guy who's five foot seven and he's going up against two center backs that are six foot five apiece. That was the start of me feeling like, OK, that's a bad look. This is not what you want. Yeah. Um, all right. Do you want to talk about the this consistent theme of giving up soft goals? So that's yep. what I was identifying in the Omaha game. And let's move ahead and talk about the Central Valley Fuego game yep. where got notes on that. We, we traveled to uh, Fresno and we lost one to zero. And tell me what, tell me what you saw in there. Where do you want to start? First 15 minutes, there was four, four opportunities to score. I mean, like good opportunities for velocity, uh, for velocity, yep. um, shots from outside the box shots that hit the post. Um, Doling made a run at one point and he wasn't hit properly uh, by, by uh, the winger. Mm-hmm. And so, Hey, props to Doling. I know we've given him a hard time for not running, but he was running. He was making the run. You're talking about where a Yep. Should yep. have crossed it to him. Yep. Uh, and so you see this difference uh, in not passing when maybe they should. Uh, so offensively, so we'll start, you know, I know we're going to talk defensive, but offensively, they're not dropping the ball when they need to. There's de- there has been a, a diminished trust and yes. a diminished like f- like confidence in one another that I, def- I definitely saw a lot of that in the Central Valley Fuego game as well as the Omaha game where heads were dropping. Yeah, I think that. The vibes just have been off as far as velocity, even in the Greenville game, let's be honest, until the second half, which we'll get to. So one of the things I wonder, and maybe you have insights on this, so this is kind of diving into the overall mentality, yeah. is as at the end of a season in a league one for a League One team, how many players are going to be coming back and how many players are thinking about the next team they potentially could need to be on, right, after this season's oh. over, right? And if you have the ball and you can score... Yeah. versus drop it off for the to win for the for your team that's a you know you start to make business decisions and hmm. and i'm not saying that that's the case i'm not i'm not accusing anyone of that but i could also very much understand if people are make starting to make some business decisions uh versus a team decision when it comes to the end of the season and i don't know if that's the case i don't want to no it's a great thought experiment yeah and i'm really curious about that young players who are trying to earn another contract. You know, mm-hmm. they want to they, they want another year because typically we've talked about this in the past, the contracts, and I'll talk about this with Ryan when he comes on the podcast, like it's usually a one and one. So you get a one year contract and sometimes there's an option for a second mm-hmm. year. And that option is typically determined by both the player and the ownership. Mm-hmm. So do they want me to stick around? Do, um, and do I want to stick around? Yeah. So It's a it's a great thing to think about because I hadn't even thought about the fact that we're approaching the end of the season. They've only got two games left. Sure. You got two games and and you got to get some stats put on the board. And I'm not saying that was the case because like in the Fuego game, uh, truly, we could have won that game. No, we we didn't. We didn't play great at times, but other times we played pretty darn good. The second half was much better. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely got disheartened so much by what I saw in the first half because there were just too many moments of really speculative deep balls down Mm -hmm. the channels to like no one in particular a lot of giveaways gotta be honest with you our back three when they were trying to um build out for and create some attack we weren't like playing through the lines we were just bombing it down the field and like you know our our defenders gave the ball away a lot yeah they did and it feels like a little helter skelter the last couple games where it's a scramble it's either a scramble or a missed assignment um, and so when I went, when I went back and watched some of the highlights of Fuego, um, I, w- I saw the game, but when I watched the highlights, um, I kept thinking, gosh, the, it, 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 someone's out of position. Someone's mm-hmm. always out of position. We're trying to scramble back or may, someone makes too, too much of an offensive run and doesn't make it back defensively. So our midfield, sometimes not making it back defensively and leaving some gaps there. So that was my take on the Fuego game. The scramble, the scramble thing you brought up. I want to, I want to mm-hmm. come back to that for just a second because The goal, when I was talking about miscues and soft goals conceded during this run of bad form. Again, four losses in a row, winless in five. In the game against Central Valley Fuego, they scored a goal, corner kick, fifth minute. Fuego's best player, right? Siobhan John Brown, dangerous player, winger. He's got a lot of goals. Totally unmarked on the back post on this corner kick, right? Ball takes two touches. It finds Siobhan John Brown. He has a free hit. This is one of those scrambly moments. The defenders are not... They're not clear on what what they're doing or what their assignment is on marking a set piece, marking a corner kick, right? And there's no one on the no one on the line. There's no yeah. goal line defense. There's no one at the posts. You know, they're scrambling. They're and scrambling. The, this, the word scrambling is is perfect that you just used. And Brooks makes a great save, but it's got this. It takes this hierarchy deflection right back to John Brown. He then crosses it across the goal. Fuego center back Sean Vinberg boxes out Ish Jome. 
slots it into the goal way too freaking easy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this happens, this happens in all leagues. I was just watching England and Greece last week and Greece beat England for the first time in 40 years. Well, there were moments in that game where England's scrambling defensively yeah. and no one knows what's going on. And then they just sort of dribble through or, or a ball scrambles around and it goes in and no one's taking responsibility and owning that moment. And it feels like the same thing's happening here that no one uh, in that environment is, is taking responsibility for uh, the ball bouncing, the ball dribbling. I know they're trying, everybody's trying hard. That's not, it's not a question of effort, mm-hmm. uh, but it is, a question of communication maybe or maybe a question of of whose responsibility is this and if no one's taking it then i'm going to take it yeah and it's it, all of it both attacking and defending it's there's communication issues that are happening right now yeah. that just feel kind of consistently a problem and um you, i have the same observation about the masango moment it was the 73rd minute um he finds the ball he receives a pass from out out in the wing on the right and then he's in the middle of the pitch and he beats a couple players which we all know Masango can do he's got that you know FIFA video game ability to take people on 1v1 on ball he's just amazing he's great at it but sometimes and you know he's not typically a selfish player so I don't think this is I think this is just a, a couple moments that I think he'd like to get back you mentioned the cross he should have made to Josh when Josh made a run into the box earlier in the game in the 73rd minute he has Anwar right there mm-hmm. and it would have been the most basic pass and with a guy like Anwar I think he would take in it first touch and at least uh put it on frame and tested the keeper yeah just in general a lot of communication gaps it just felt like both defensing defensively and an attack anything more on the central life I go nope no, nope. glad it's over yeah <laughs> exactly exactly let's take a quick break when we return we'll talk about Saturday's game Velocity FC versus Greenville Triumph This episode of the Spokane Soccer Show is brought to you by Feast World Kitchen. If you know, you know. If you don't know, I'm about to tell you. Think authentic mouth-watering cuisine from all over the world delivered to your mouth right here in downtown Spokane. Here's the part you might not have known. Feast is a nonprofit that effectively creates chef entrepreneurs by offering a bunch of programs where immigrants and former refugees learn career skills, earn income from their food sales, and build connections in the community. Quick sidebar, I still have daydreams about the beef sambusas and the spicy jollof rice that we had during the AFCON watch party in January. But don't take my word for it. Head down to Feast World Kitchen on 3rd Avenue, follow them on Instagram, or go to their website at feastworldkitchen.org. This Saturday, Velocity FC 2, Greenville Triumph 3. The XG on this one was actually Spokane 2.6, Greenville 1.9. 1.9. See, that was my heart. That's what I was telling you. I felt yeah. like uh, Spokane had ample chances. Greenfield didn't have as many, but they made good on them. It's true. Um, the onslaught of soft goals continued in this game, unfortunately. But Scott, what did you observe early on in the game? Yeah. So for me, I thought we had that chance early on with Playa's is the breakaway. And so he's breaking away at left off left, off left center of the goal, um, driving towards the goal. And then uh, he could have gone left foot shot top of the 18, but that would have been a tough shot. Mm-hmm. So he starts to cut it back. And what I noticed was he didn't drop it to a call. I, he I was remember running this. Up the side. That's right. And so what's really interesting and. And I'm, you know, I'm just going to ask the question. I'm not making any accus- accusations, but the game before, Kali didn't drop it to play. Yeah. It's right in the exact same position uh, that he could have. And that it, very similar. You, you and, know what? Yeah, this happened has happened. A similar thing is going on with Zephyr, too. Mm-hmm. These are brand new teams. Yeah. And in the case of a Kale, he has only played what? Let's say two thirds of the season with mm-hmm. us. And with Palaya's, he's brand new. Yeah. So they don't have any familiarity yeah. with one another. You will get to a point. There were a couple of miscues with Emma Jaskinik and Mackenzie Weinert where it was like, oh, Kenzie wanted the ball here and she, you know, Jaskinik played it uh, somewhere else. And it was like, again, one of those moments of through reps, I think it'll get better. Oh, totally. And I think it'll get better not only um, just through the reps, but you understand a player's strengths. Yeah. And I mean, just preferences and just preferences. I mean, I play with people for multiple years and it takes in some cases, multiple years to really pick up the nuance because you're not in enough situations playing with someone. I mean, they're practicing every day, obviously, but they're not enough uh, game situations to know all of the scenarios and how the person's going to act or react in that, in that situation. Anything you do in training, Mm -hmm. 
doesn't come close to what it's like to be in a live game against a really good opponent like Greenville. Yeah. So. And if, and if, if, if you have not gone down, if you go to the games and you don't go down by the field in the middle of the game, I'd encourage you to do that at some point mm-hmm. because the speed of the game is pretty incredible. Oh, it's awesome. Uh, and so we're making these uh, assumptions watching from a distance, but these are, these are split second decisions uh, by very talented athletes. So the conceding soft goals theme continued, sadly. So yeah, it's minute 15. Andre receives the ball in midfield from Jack. Now, on this pass, it was admittedly kind of a weak pass from from Jack. I think Jack, if he'd put a little bit more on this pass to Andre, head down the left, he's got Louise Heel looking to connect play. And I think they can actually do something threatening, right? Instead, Andre kind of has to retreat back to the ball a little bit, and it allows uh, Greenville to spring the the press, right? So Ben Zakowski, midfielder for uh, Greenville, comes and picks Andre's pocket and launches a counterattack. Now, in that moment, this is what bugged me about it. And I think you already mentioned this a bit. Velocity didn't respond like they recognized the imminent threat. Javier Martin Hill sees what's happening and he's kind of jogging back in, in the recovery mm-hmm. for the team. Um, Andre isn't exactly sprinting back either, even no, though he's not. the one who got his pocket picked, right? Mm-hmm. Zakowski ends up giving Cameron Miller the eyes, pretends he's going to pass it down the right to Sebastian Velasquez. Ahmed cheats inside to mark their center forward, Leo Castro, who's a really dangerous attacking player. He's got seven goals in the season. Zakowski splits Javier Martin Hill and Ahmed with a pass out to the left to none other than Liam McKinnon, who is the current, as a result of Saturday's game, golden boot leader for the most goals scored in USL League One in 2024. He's all alone. He's the most dangerous player in League One. He came into this game with 12 goals. He left with 14. McKinnon fakes the shot, but instead just rolls it back onto his right foot. Ahmed flies into a tackle, completely takes out McKinnon. It's a penalty. And at the end of that play, you could see Ahmed's frustration of there was way too much to do yeah. as a defender. And, you know, he was left pretty helpless. Now, should he have flown into that tackle the way that he did? No, but it's it's Lyme McKinnon. Yeah. And any attacking player of the pedigree of somebody like McKinnon is going to have a lot of options right there. And the the reality is Ahmed shouldn't have been put into that position to have to like, OK, do I have Castro? Yeah, I, do I? And there was a back to this issue of trust and communication. And it happened a couple of times and it happened later in this game. In fact, it didn't feel like Ahmed was trusting Cameron Miller to mark Leo Castro one yeah. v one because Cameron Miller was there. They kind of collapsed, but yep. they didn't. Yeah. So yeah. they end up both defending Castro. And Zakowski spotted that immediately and was like, cool, Liam McKinnon's wide open. Did he did he did he drag his own leg backwards a little bit to, you know, draw the foul? Of course he did. Right. He either he either knew that it's so funny because the same play happened in Zephyr's game yesterday against Lexington. So um, he knew that one of two things was going to happen, um, that Ahmed's going to come and make a challenge. And once he commits his weight into that challenge, whether he makes contact with me or not, I'm going to have him because then I'm just going to take it in on my right foot. And it's Mm -hmm. me versus the keeper. It was a soft goal because the reality is we didn't respond to that counterattack as though it, that moment had the threat that it ultimately had, which led to a goal. So, um, and that happened again. Yeah. Do you want to talk about their, (laughs) their second goal? And so then their second goal around this one frustrates me worse, by the way. Yeah. 22 minutes. Um, and so it's very similar instance where there's sort of a breakaway, um, not, not quite as a uh, breakaway ish, but it's a breakaway. The field is beginning to split. Our, our, our it, midfield is st- starting to, it's, split. it's funny this play because Jamie Smith, who's a defender, just basically sends up a diagonal out of 50, 60 yards to the right. And it just falls into the feet of Zakowski. Hey, and I want to say props to Jamie Smith, yeah. number four, because I would like to invite him to play on Sunday whenever he wants at the South Hill, uh, because I think he would dominate. Because when you look at the field and you look at Jamie Smith, it's easy to make judgments of people, just how they look. Yeah, but, dude, but, I know. But the guy plays, man. He, he props balls. To you. So <laughs> I don't know where you are, Jamie Smith, but props to you because English footballer, but he does not in look face, like everybody. A, he does not no. look like a professional footballer. No, no, no. <laughs> You know, he should be like, he looks like he's installing sprinklers or something, but I'm just telling you <laughs> props so to him, props to him. Um, so yeah, 22nd minute. So basically what, what happens is, is they begin to drive the ball forward and it's a very similar situation in which 
you get uh, Greenville's winger cutting back the cutting the ball back to the middle. And there's there's actually there's two players there. And Jack Denton's kind of coming up. Andre Lewis is kind of coming up. Waldeck's kind of coming up, but they're all sort of equidistance away from this person. And no one really with urgency crashes on yeah. um, the eventual goal scorer at the top of the box. You know, it's funny. This was a play that once Jamie Smith passed that ball down the channel and Zakowski ended up on the end of that pass. We actually had one V one defending with three defenders. Yeah. It, we it had, actually looked like it was going to be okay. It was okay. Yeah, yeah. That's right. We had Ish Jome marking Zakowski mm-hmm. out on the right. We had, Cameron Miller in the middle, marking Leo Castro, their center forward. And we had Ahmed marking Liam McKinnon. Yep. Okay. But what happens is Zakowski cuts in on his left foot, cuts inside. Leaves Ish behind. Yeah. It, well, Ish tracks him okay enough that he's not going to allow him to take a shot. No, which he's is not going to allow him job. to go around him. But yep. the problem is, and I don't want to pick on Ahmed, but Ahmed left McKinnon to give extra help on Castro. And that was a mistake. So is this a theme that you're seeing where he's rotating, helping? Is it just him and Cam starting to become a partnership? Trust and communication. communication, Now, dude, we've talked about this so many times. What is the job of a center forward? It's not to just take on and occupy the single center back, a single center back is to split them. Yeah. You want to draw attention from both the center backs. That's Make a center, them choose. That's a center forward's job, right. right? And if he can get the attention of both center backs, which is what he did in this moment, what does it do? It leaves the most dangerous player in League One at the top of the box because basically what happens is when Ahmed shades toward Castro, when Zakowski cuts inside, here comes McKinnon. He just drifts ever so slightly to the top of the box. But but you have a you if you have a if you have a midfielder that's going to defense a midfielder. Come on, that, we we didn't. So, no, no, right, so that, ba- back to the point you made. Nobody came back to help on the recovery. And this was the twenty second minute. So this wasn't yeah. the eighty fifth minute no. where everyone's tired. Yeah, no. Communication. Yep. Communication. Well, <laughs> again, the theme: conceding soft goals. Third goal, set piece, sixty seventh minute. I'll go. Th- I'll go through this one quickly because I want to get to the good news. There is good mm-hmm. news that comes in this game. Okay, it just comes late. Third goal. 67th minute, Sebastian Velasquez, it's a free kick, it's a free kick on the, the right side, sends in a cross. It's really straightforward. Mm-hmm. Ish Jome doesn't pick up Leo Castro. He has a free header. Honestly, I looked at this play pretty closely. If Castro doesn't get to that ball, I think defender Brandon Frick was going to beat his marker and have a shot at the near post, similar to the goal that we gave up to another center back, Vinberg, in the Fuego game. Just it was just bad defending. Again, it's like not not properly marking. There were at least two players who were ahead of velocity defenders to Brooks Thompson's near post. And it was kind of an odd goal where where better. I know I just I did said I just had to like want to be clear. Was it an outstanding finish from Leo Castro? Yes. Should we have had, should was he have been pl- marked? What, yes. Was it planned? Yeah. 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 I, I mean, just, it was, it was is, a pretty is, straightforward set. Piece. Is, is that a play where he comes out to him? Just skin. I mean, like it was pretty smooth. And, and no, he had a free header. Yeah. Is all it was. And a good experienced a striker like Leo Castro. Yeah. And this has been a recurrent theme throughout this podcast, talking about league one and velocity. If I have a wish list for next year, it's just a little bit more of that pedigree and experience. I think we have it in Anwar Palaios. I want to be really clear. We know we have it in Luis Hill. We know we have it in Colin Fernandez. We've got some of these veteran players with a lot of not just acumen, but experience. So Leo Castro, that's just a goal scorer's goal. He's scored a lot of goals in his career. It was nice. Um, now for the good news, Scott. Yeah, I am. I, I, I am going to sing my love for Josh Doling. Okay, um, let's go. Yeah. So I'll start with this. Anwar Palaez, first of all, made his first start, played full 90. Okay. Luis Heal recovered from his hamstring, hamstring injury, and he played 63 minutes. He was subbed off in the 63rd minute for yeah, Josh, Josh Doling. Doling. So when he entered the game, we were up in the stands and I jokingly said, what if Josh Doling, Doling, Doling goes for a hat trick and we like win or tie this game? <laughs> and he comes in and that's the best I've seen him play. I don't know about you, but for me, um, in terms of just a stretch of play, mm. he his entry into his entry changed the quality of the game. He played really well in the the game that we drew with Tormenta three to three mm-hmm. a, a couple months ago. But I you're, you're right. Yeah. It's this was also really, really good. This was and so he comes in immediately he draws up he draws a penalty. And I don't know how their how their penalty structure is in terms of who typically takes it, but a- Andre, it seemed like he gave it to Doling or Lee, Lee, Lee has said that there is no designated PK taker. I think in the games where it's just like you know, when Luis heals out there, Luis is probably going to grab it. But in that particular instance, just like the first game of the season, 
Josh grabbed that and was never going to let it go. Props to him. And then he buries it. So then, okay, now we're off the schneid. Now we're, now we're moving. And the role that he played is like a, uh, a withdrawn nine a little yep. bit. So about that penalty real quick, I just want yeah. to point something out. It's Cause it's funny that the symmetry of that, I, I just, I couldn't get enough of, um, March 9th, velocity's first ever goal as a club. That day, Josh beat goalkeeper Christian Garner by going to his left against Greenville. Garner guessed correctly, but Josh placed it perfectly, right? Fast forward to Saturday night. Our first goal in 480 minutes, Josh gets a penalty, goes left again. This time it's uh, Rankenberg. He guesses correctly, gets a paw on it, but it's just hit with too much power. So shout out, Josh. Great job to to get the pen. So what I loved about uh, Josh in this game was... um, he had more, he had a little more tenacity and he, uh, it felt like the pressure was off of him with Palaya's in there doing some of the dirty work and running. When I did my preview podcast back in February with my friend, Brandon Mays, he brought up the one thing that he hoped for from what he had seen and what he had scouted about Josh. And it was during his time for New Mexico United, he played around 800 minutes. He had four goals, three assists. What Brandon pointed out was he was playing with another striker, Greg Hurst. And Greg Hurst often played not just as a second striker, but also sometimes as an attacking midfielder for New Mexico. And I just think that that's where Josh's game is at. The thing I want to point out about this game even is as excited as I've been to see what Palias could offer, he was starved of service in the first half. It looked kind of like a familiar pattern that we've had a problem with of like, are we going to get any opportunities to our center forward, even with Luis Hill out there? Yes, Luis hasn't played in a bit. He's coming back from uh, recovering from an injury. So give this some time. But seeing us play in a two striker set. So we played in a four, four, two for the last 20 minutes of the game. And that <laughs> looked amazing. And, and yeah. It, and then what we didn't get beat was down the wings. Yeah. Right. You know, because in, in this three, this three back, uh, three back structure we've been playing, there seems to be a lot of opening. We've had a wings. lot. We've had yeah. a lot of vulnerable because they're not, to, cut, to they're not coming back. Yeah. yeah. But we go four, four, two. And all of a sudden Josh withdraws a little bit. Palias is out front. I agree. They've been he's been starved of service, but you can see the opportunities with Palias because he's making those runs. And I think, you know, us given me giving a hard time to doling over the course of the year of not making runs. Well, maybe that's just not his game. Maybe he plays better as a as a withdrawn striker, holding striker, yep. uh, holding forward that can then drop it off to Playas, or you you throw in Luis Heel or someone else. You know, Kali's going to cross it, and you're going to have more opportunities. Yep. Maybe that's the maybe maybe we win the championship now. No, settle down. So what? <laughs> the thing I but dude, I'm just it, hoping there's just, so much to be hoping, excited about yeah. because of how this transpired after the after the we go down three to zero. I actually stopped paying attention to the game. And just started to like vibe with my family mm-hmm. because Michael and Vanessa were there. Um, shout out Wildland Co-op. My two daughters were with me and we were just like kind of having fun. And I was just, you know, a little bit brokenhearted about the fact that we're just on this terrible run of games. And then we get the penalty and the the four four two looks kind of fun. And the vibe shift is yeah. dramatic. And then on that particular play with the, the second goal and 90 plus two. Javier Martin Hill saw a bad pass attempted by Zion Scarlett um, for Greenville. Darts into the midfield, grabs the ball, immediately gives it to Andre Lewis. And then to your point, you've got Josh in a withdrawn. He's in like a he's between the lines and like the half space. Okay, he's facing the fullback Tyler Pollock on who's a left back and Daniel Wu, the left center back. And he's occupying them. He's facing them. OK. And then you've got Andre who plays the, the ball to Anwar Palaya's feet. Anwar's got his back to goal. And he's doing exactly what we were talking about with Castro. He's splitting the center back. So he's got he's right in the middle of um, Daniel Wu and Brandon Frick, the center backs. Right. Plays just a simple wall pass. Just beautiful, simple, but effective stuff. And you're right. It's Josh's best part of his game. Anwar immediately sees Josh in that half space, plays it to Josh. Daniel Wu rushes out to try to close down on Josh, but he's too late because Josh takes one touch and a perfect weighted pass is that touch. Pollock comes, tries to collapse in. So does Wu, but they're late because Palias makes a really, truly potent center forward run and just boom. It's and it's bang, bang, Scott. It's it's tight. Yeah, yeah, dude. So tight. At first, I thought it must have taken a deflection. No, he just beat those players there by like a millisecond. And and Darling, but that's all it takes. Darling plays the 
perfect ball. Perfect. And so when we, we you know, we harped on about uh, lack of communication, selfishness, or whatever the case is, lack of trust. Yeah. Uh, but in this instance, you had two players that understood each other, just even if it was for a moment and, and Josh trusts the run. Yeah. And he lays the ball in a perfect type and Plyas trusts himself because he's running into a space that is not an easy space. And in fact, um, uh, the keeper even came out, but how he, how he hits it, that was sublime. It was a really cool moment because if you didn't know better, if you just came out of some other country and were coming to the United States to watch a random soccer game and you watched that moment, you'd go, Oh, these players must've played together for a while Yeah, because of how Josh was set up yeah. and where Anwar was the spacing for everybody what they were trying to do. And what I love about that going into these final two games into the playoffs that we've now secured a place in, right? Is we don't have to worry anymore about risking anybody because this is, this, this is it. all yeah. going to come into this. Yeah. H having said that in these final two games, I will be shocked if Lee Viedman isn't a little bit conservative with his selections. I, I hope he is because he's probably going to save all his firepower for the playoffs. But even if he doesn't trot out a 4-4-2. So people who are going to watch our next two games against Northern Colorado and one Knox don't expect Lee Viedman to start a 4-4-2 just because of this moment we're describing. Yes, it was really cool, but it's also like a thing that you want to make your, you want to choose your moments when you deploy something like that, right? Well, and, and even if he doesn't go 4-4-2, if he goes 4-3-3 or something like this, the idea that we've, we've been putting so much pressure on our wing backs to push forward and to create opportunities through that, that's the route. Mm -hmm. And this keeps pushing it through. Um, game finished three, two fans were extremely stoked. The momentum shifted completely. I think it's something the team can build on. Absolutely. But, um, none of that'll matter if we don't stop shipping soft goals. Next up is Northern Colorado on Saturday, the 19th. Then the final home game in the first ever season for, for velocity FC will be at one stadium where we'll host one Knoxville Saturday, October 26th, 7 PM. Scott, let's take one more quick break. When we return, we'll catch up on Zephyr FC's recent games, including the 3-2 loss to Lexington SC on Sunday. The Spokane Soccer Show is supported by Spokane City Credit Union. Are you a customer at a big, dumb bank? Well, stop it. At a bank, you're just a customer. At a credit union, you're a member and a shareholder. You can help make decisions about what the credit union does do or doesn't do. Banks just want to get bigger by swallowing up smaller banks one at a time until there's only one or two banks left. Nobody wants that. It well, except for big banks. Since 1934, Spokane City Credit Union has remained independent, relevant, and local, with a focus on the financial needs of individuals and families in Spokane City. Go to sccu.net, Spokane City Credit Union, serving Spokane one member at a time. All right, Scott, you haven't had a chance to watch as many Zephyr FC games. There's only a few lunatics among us that are watching all the games for both the USL Spokane teams. I get it. It's like, I feel like anybody, it's like wealth management. You have to just pick and choose the things that you can pay attention to. And there's a lot of yeah. soccer on display and served up in the menu of Spokane. So I get it. Have yeah, it, it is. Tough. I really we, we've gone to the games that we're able to go to. And then other things when the scheduling changed from six to two, which I think is much better for a lot of people. It wasn't good for us. That caught a lot of people. Yeah. And, and that's that's cool. I mean, I get I get it for the club. I uh, haven't had a chance, but I've watched as much as I could and watched highlights and things like that. So Michael and Vanessa mm -hmm. Wildman Co-op shout out sponsor of the show. Double pivot, double pivot pub ale. They have been ruled out because of the change. Yeah. And they bought season tickets. Well, Zephyr FC have suffered back to back losses. The, res the results have not gone our way, but I will say that the vibes have been immaculate. Yeah. Zephyr FC one Dallas Trinity two on October 6th at one stadium. As I mentioned, I will say this about Trinity. I think they're the best team in super league. I've stuck by my answer that it's Dallas Trinity and I haven't moved off that Carolina is currently top of the league, but I think that the quality of Dallas Trinity is just insane. They have these super experienced players like their striker, Allie Thornton, Midfielder Amber Brooks. Thornton played several years in France and Belgium, scored a bunch of goals. Amber Brooks has over 150 appearances in the NWSL. She, I think Jamie brought this up on the podcast, but Amber Brooks had a very funny moment where she was playing against San Diego Wave um, end of 2022, and she gave the double bird to the fans late in the game. <laughs> she, got, <laughs> she got suspended, but yeah, she gave the double bird to That's kind of the San Diego Wave fans and was suspended playing for Washington Spirit. The player that I was the most concerned about, winger Choma Ubogagu, she has played for Arsenal, 
Real Madrid, Tottenham, and Orlando Pride. She has already lit up the USL Super League, and she, against us, had her one moment, and that's all it, that mattered. She started on the left side of um, a front three, and in minute 36, she and her counterpart on the right, Lucy Shepard, they swapped wings. Taryn Reese, who's been playing as like a converted winger or forward to playing left back, she had her, she's done such a good job. I've been so impressed by her her role as a left back as somebody who has not played that position very much that I'm aware of. But it's just one of these moments where, you know, defenders when they're trying to shield the ball as it's getting ready to go across the end line and they're like, oh, okay, it's going to be a, it's going to be a goal kick. We're good to go here. Well, Ubo Gagu's clever. And so what does she do? She watches Taryn Reese attempting to shield the ball over the end line. And at the very last second, she pokes it between Taryn Reese's legs and Taryn Reese is off balance and Ubogog was just like got a free cross, goes back post, picks out a run by defender Hannah Davison, Alyssa Bourgeois, who's giving up six inches in height to Davison and Davison buries it back post. And it was a great, just a great moment of like quality. One of those, you got to finish your chances, even your half chances. This was probably more than a half chance. And I'd say, again, there's kind of a theme for some of these goals we've been describing. Lots of con- conceded goals from set pieces and corners. Minute 58, Trinity midfielder Jenny Danielson crosses it into the box. Haley Thomas, just for Scott, I swear, it was like a half second. She gets caught ball watching, like literally half second. Gracie Bryan, this midfielder for Dallas Trinity, she slips in for a header back post and it's 2-0. And at that point, it's like we're down 2-0 against a team that I think is the best team in the league. But we showed some fight. We got a scrappy goal from a corner. And then did you see the penalty? Mm Mm-hmm. So five minutes into added time, minute 95, I think Zephyr have done a great job of clawing back into this game and making, making it really competitive. Jody Ulkeko plays the ball in behind the defenders for Mackenzie Weiner. Weiner runs onto it. Trinity goalkeeper Madison White comes off her line like a freaking maniac. She has three defenders around her, but for some reason... It's like that moment of madness that can happen sometimes. And we talked about this with with Izzy Nino early on the season when we gave up that penalty to Brooklyn, where when a goalkeeper comes off their line and becomes a defender and then is like, but I also have my hands. And like she goes to ground with both hands, takes out Mackenzie Weiner. And I will say this about the Instagram reel that I uploaded about this moment. It is my most popular ever piece of content. <laughs> really? 43,000 views and 102 comments and counting, Scott. Wow. Anyway, final stat line in the game. Shots. Uh, Spokane had 19, 7 on target. Dallas had 8, but 6 on target. So let's talk really quickly about Zephyr FC2, Lexington SC3. Did you get to watch the highlights from this one? I did watch the highlights again in this one. One of the very first great calls in the game from uh, Jessica Sharman, the commentator, was in minute 18. And this is when I, my, I just was... Totally devastated. Lexington midfielder Shea Moyer takes a shot. It's maybe a cross for winger Amanda Allen, who's making a run far post. It's maybe a shot, I, it, but I think it was a cross. Nonetheless, Izzy Nino neither punches nor gathers the ball. She kind of slaps it, and then it goes over her head, and it loops over her head, and before she can even like respond and recover, it's in the back of the net. Yep. And I just sat there dumbfounded. Like, did that just take place? And I mean, it literally looked like if you ever watched volleyball, right? And a set. Yeah. It looked like a set. Yeah. Cause sometimes in those instances they'll punch. Right. She, right. Did, she didn't either. And that's what and uh, was, Jessica Sharman, the commentator is a former goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. And she was like, Oh, this is a, what a goalkeeper does when they're caught in two minds. She it, neither punched she, nor get, nor, uh, nor collected. Yeah. And I was wondering, she just got caught in the She's middle. like yep. open-handed. Now here's the funny part, Scott. I was like, it looked like a volleyball player. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. Did you go, did you go research her? Izzy Nino, I remember yeah. from the research, was a four-year varsity starter for Detroit Country Day in high school. So I think she had a moment of just doing a little bit of a volleyball thing. I, I agree with the Ugh. I agree with the commentator that you get caught in two minds, right? So sometimes the, the forward will get caught between, do I head it or do I step back and try to lift my foot up and, and, and tap it? Um, what do I do? I chest it. Yep. And I think you get caught maybe as a goalkeeper, you get caught in the same, same boat. It still was a horrible goal to concede because immediately you're on your back foot and there's pressure and you're at home. And we, we know the importance of getting points at home because we're getting ready to, we're, we have one more game at home. Yeah. And 26th. right now we're, we're near the bottom of the table. So I think coming into this game, the goal would have been not just get three points, but also maybe put a few past Lexington. Yeah. Maybe we finally 
you know, make good on all of our chances and we get some goal differential. That did not happen. Minute 36, corner kick for Zephyr, in swinger for Marla Canales. She finds Kenzie Weiner back post. She scuffs the shot and it may have been handled by a Lexington defender. I don't think it was. And I'm didn't matter because Emma Jaskinik was there. She put it away. Another scrappy goal for us from a corner. We've got to start scoring our from our best made chances, though. Like scoring these scrappy goals from corners is not what you want to be doing. Um, minute 48. Lexington SC equalizes, or sorry, they go ahead by a goal again. Sarah Clark's dispossessed and left touch line by center forward Madison Parsons. Parsons then carries the ball into the box, squares it for Amanda Allen. Her shot is saved, um, but midfielder Mary Kate McGuire is trailing the play, buries it. They're up two to one, and I'm sitting there going, this is just like, I don't think we're going to catch a break here. Yeah. And the other thing that happened is the second half, I'm standing next to people, they, this uh, couple, right? And they keep shouting out Kenzie every time that there's an attacking play happening for Zephyr. And I was just like, do you, are you Kenzie? And they're like, yep. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Nice to meet you. So shout out Deidre and Mike Weiner, Kenzie's folks. They were super, super cool and kind. And it was very fun to stand next to them and watch the game with my friend Heather. So then we save the best for last. The best goal of the game, the best goal of the season for Zephyr FC. One of the best goals that either of our teams has, has scored. Haley Thomas has the ball. Picks out a run on the left from Amina Ekic, and she pings, Scott, a 50-yard, minimally 50-yard diagonal ball. It takes one hop and finds Ekic perfectly in stride. And here's my favorite part. So you remember the play with Lyme McKinnon when he gets the ball from Ben Zakowski, mm -hmm. and he sees Ahmed Longmire flying out to close down, and he watches the flyby. Exact same thing happens. Yeah, uh, cool. yeah. the defender, Madison Perez, expects... Amina Ekic to do something with her left foot, her dominant foot. Everybody who who scouts anybody would know that Amina, Ek Amina Ekic is a very left foot dominant player. Ekic pulls the bat, pulls the ball back onto her weaker right foot and smashes it upper ninety. Total Charlie Charlie Brown Lucy moment. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. She, she's my favorite player. Oh, she's so good. Yeah. So game's tied two two, and we had literally all the momentum for the next thirty minutes. Spokane yeah. completely dominated the game, generated nine shots, but. Lexington goalkeeper Sarah Cox was the best player on the pitch. She had six saves. She made so many important, decisive saves and like comes off her line. And she was just really, really, um, you know, doing everything you'd expect a, a, a keeper having a great game to do in terms of like marshalling the defense. And like they look that that team played with so much grit and determination. They really wanted to get not only a point, but they wanted to get all three points. So game's tied 2 two, and I'm standing there and we're like, we've got to get all three points. Like we've dominated for the last 20 minutes, nine shots and six saves and all this crap, right? At one point, Marley Canales receives a cross from Jenny Vetter. She's at the top of the box. She hits it perfectly, strikes the left post, falls to the feet of Kenzie Weiner, who's crashing the box. And she puts her, she gets a shot off, but it's saved by Cox again. It was just like unreal stuff. And as we're sitting there and I'm going, we've got to make good on this. Like we've got to get all three points here. This is like, we've got the momentum We're we're, you know, attacking like regularly. And I'm standing next to Weiner's folks, right? I went to a Gonzaga game last year and it was against Loyola Marymount. It was a really important WCC game that they needed to win. And they definitely couldn't lose. And they were down one to zero. And a couple parents came over and were watching the game near me, right? It was uh, Maddie Kemp's folks. And they were down 1-0 and it was like minute 85 or something. And they were like, we shouldn't have stood next to you. I think we, I think it cursed the game. And I was like, <laughs> what, what, but, but you can't say that. What about all the games that I came to that, that Gonzaga won? You know, yeah. like, it's not me. It's not Benji. It's not me. And then um, in that game, Kelsey Euler equalized. And they got the all important point, which didn't turn out to matter because they ended up getting the final win against Pepperdine. But it felt like massive to just get that one point. OK, so I told that story about how these parents thought I was a curse because I was right. Fast was, forward to 90 dude, plus four. I swear to God. And so we're here in like the 90 <laughs> first was 90 second minute when this happened, when yeah. I was telling getting ready to tell this. I was telling the story in the middle of telling the story. And I said, you know, the one thing you don't want to do here is you know, not, not keep the point. You want the point. Yeah. You know, the, the, you definitely don't want to lose. <laughs> Here comes Lexington and they win a corner kick and the corner kick drives me crazy. Cause here's what happens on this, right? By the way, the ref was going to blow her whistle right after this corner. It's the last play of the game. That's hot. That's brutal. 
Madison Perez in swinger for Lexington. It's a designed corner. Okay. Lexington's doing the thing where they have a bunch of players that are crowding the keeper. Perez is aiming for the penalty spot. Okay. The 12 yards out. Sydney Shepard, a uh, player for Lexington, drops back, ends up with a free header because it was a design player. Like they, this is the set piece that they wanted to do. All the players retreat, including Sydney Shepard. And she got her head on it and it was just perfect. Boom. Not quite top left corner, but out of the reach of Izzy Nino, who was kind of caught in two minds. She started to come off her line to come out and punch. But yeah, and 3 2 winner. Lexington get their first win as a club at our expense. Um, shout out to them. I mean, I think they they played really well. They played like they were going to come here and they were going to upset uh, our team. And they did. This sucks. Yeah. Yeah. It's super brutal. Um, one more thing I want to say about this game, thinking of one of my favorite players on the team and one of our, our friend, good friend of the podcast, Mike Policio, his favorite player. He's told me this many times. Taryn Reese went down with a minimal or non-contact injury in the sixth minute and it doesn't look good. That's not good. Uh, I hope it's not an ACL, but it's hard not to imagine that that's what it could be, which would be really, really devastating. So thoughts, prayers, Damn. get well. Hopefully um, Taryn Reese is okay. So I'm sure she'll get a scan and we'll find out, but okay, Scott, we did it. That was a lot of soccer to talk about. A lot of soccer. We have the last two home games until March. Listen, folks, I can't stress this enough. A lot of season ticket holders aren't showing up to games. I just want to point that out. I can kind of tell because I can see where all the season ticket seats sure. are because I've been watching the games from the, the northeast corner. I love to go there. And then I go mm -hmm. to the southeast corner for the second half just because what you talked about that when you can get close to the pitch, yeah. you appreciate the power, the speed, the pace, yeah. the, the sounds, everything so much more. So I've been I've been watching from there and I can see this the grandstand. There's a lot of season ticket holders are, are coming to games. So you better come and watch. The last two games, October 26th, Velocity host one Knox. That's a Saturday. And then October 27th, it's a Sunday. Zephyr host Tampa Bay. And after that, it's on the road. So okay. this is it. So the last the last Velocity game is the 26th. Yep. Okay. The last regular season. And then it, they're in the playoffs, but they are not going to. Unless somehow Richmond kickers made the final, mm -hmm. they will not play a home game in the playoffs. So keep that in mind. We that, do not have home field advantage for anything because we're seventh place. Yeah. All right. That's it for the show. Thank you, listeners, as always. Thank you, Scott. All right. See you, brother. Until next time.